I want to wrap up the NBA regular season into some of the postseason stuff here with the play-in games. Uh, it's kind of the third annual Care Don't Care Awards for the NBA, and I'm going to run through it. All right, tanking, I don't care. I'm never going to care. This is the toughest sport to be a GM in, all right? It just is. You use your cap space on guys you don't want to use it on. You can plan for cap space in three years, and when all the good players go somewhere else, you're stuck with it, and you still have to spend it. Trades are really hard. They're going to be even more restrictive. You can't just p- trade a, a pick for a player that you would want. A lot of times you're including a contract with a player you don't even want to get rid of, and the other team doesn't necessarily even want because they want cap space that they're going to have to use in a way they don't want to. So I don't care when teams look at the lottery and go, this is our best chance of improving this because it's so hard to do it any other way. I like that we have trades for top players with a lot of picks because at least there's some vehicle for that kind of movement, even if we don't like the origin of why that player is going to be moving on with demands, et cetera, which, you know, gear up for because the next surprise is coming. I don't know who it is. Uh, so I don't get mad at Dallas for tanking, even though it felt like the packaging was grosser, that the marketing of it was a little bit grosser, even though it was the same product as some of these other teams weeks prior deciding we've got no fucking chance because Dallas didn't have a chance. Uh, They didn't have the tiebreaker with OKC. OKC finished against Utah and Memphis. Granted, I don't know that Dallas knew 100% what the lineups are going to be like, but you can probably figure out some of that stuff. And if Dallas even got out of the plan, which I think is a reach, they weren't beating anybody in the playoffs on top of everything else. Now, the lottery karma police could jump in here where they end up still losing the pick if it doesn't land in the top 10. But I don't mind it. I understand. Like Simmons and I argued about it on Sunday night. I understand his position. If you're alive for the playoffs, this whole thing is about competition. What are you doing? My point is be realistic. You weren't going to do anything. And this league is hard enough. The funny thing about tanking and credit to the commissioner Uh, Credit for fixing this somewhat with a couple of changes, both the plan, which I like parts of it, other parts I don't, and flattening the odds at the top, where the three worst record teams all have the same odds, which I don't know if they'll just cycle through in five years and change it back, being like, why are we not rewarding the worst team a little bit more? Tanking, I don't know if fixed is the right word, but it's not an epidemic the way it was years prior. And considering it's for Victor Wenbanyama this year, Considering that it was for that guy, the best prospect we've seen since LeBron James, not a better prospect than, but the best since, this ended up not being nearly as disastrous as people thought that it was going to be, whether before the season started, the first time you saw this dude on video, or even in the middle of the season. The tanking this year wasn't really that bad, and the hilarious part is like San Antonio still played hard. Houston played hard. I like it, and we'll get to Houston in a second. Portland went fucking absolute freakout mode here at the end. Detroit played tough in a lot of these games. Some of the worst worst teams would have these first halves where it felt like they were in games because their guys actually just played hard enough and cared. So the tanking thing wasn't that big of an issue, and I'm just not going to hold Dallas to a different standard when essentially they were doing the same thing, even though so many people disagree. I care about the Houston Rockets. I do. I know that surprises you. Let's look at Steven Silas, who's out as head coach. He was hired uh, October 30th. In 2020, remember that season started weird. It was uh, an NBA start to that season the last week of December. So December 2nd, uh, after Westbrook reportedly had pushed for Silas to be hired on December December 2nd, Westbrook straight into Washington. So Silas, like, wait a minute, what are we doing now? Oh, cool, I got John Wall and Hart. Remember those stories? Like now it's going to be like, it's going to be just as good, but different. Um, you know, I've heard kind of replaying the results here that Silas was hired to coach a contender. A contender is probably a bit of a reach for that Houston team, but certainly you thought with Harden or Westbrook and then whatever you thought Wall was going to be that you had at least a chance. You were going to make the playoffs to Harden alone. Well, Harden played eight games that season as he demanded a trade and was basically tanking fucking games on his own there the last week or so, and he was traded January 13th. So now Silas goes from, I thought we knew who we were going to be, to a rebuilding team. Uh, Christian Wood at one point was there, Kevin Porter and a story I read yesterday. It was like, you know, some of the pushback because you're all trying to like figure out how it's being sourced and who's saying what about who and who's making themselves look better. Who's blaming the other people? Uh, A lot of stuff was very sympathetic to Silas. I thought some other stuff was a little too critical being like, you know, they didn't really run any system like no shit. Like 23 year olds running out there dribbling the ball the whole fucking time. So Yeah, if you watched Houston, it didn't look super tight. But to suggest that Silas may have been at fault because he had issues with Christian Wood and Kevin Porter Jr., like, are you serious? Uh, I think the thing that makes me care about them is what happens in the lottery with Houston. Because Jalen Green got the keys this year, and it wasn't great. He is dynamic. 
The counting stats were really good. The efficiency was not. Uh, when I say I don't think they pass much, there's two numbers that either tell you the truth or lie to you. One is that they actually pass the ball a decent amount, like passes per game, pretty standard, pretty easy. They were middle of the pack. But the thing I noticed, assists. Like, were you passing just to pass or were you passing with a purpose and some playmaking? They were last in assist ratio in the NBA this season. And if you did watch them, it kind of backs it up. It's like, yeah, that was a pass, but like that was because you gave up on the thing that you were trying to do. Jalen Green on the right night looks incredible. Over the course of the season, it needs to be better. And I wonder if he's going to be just blindly handed the keys from the next coach. The coach will say all the right things in the interview. And it's up to Jalen Green to kind of figure out how he's going to fit in with his other teammates. Because Jabari, I thought, was stronger uh, with the basketball to close the season. Tari Eason's terrific. Shingun needs more touches. Porter's really talented, too. Uh, and there's a ton of young guys on this team that are all trying to figure out what their NBA life is going to be. And that's why a lot of times these rosters, you can't have like 12 dudes. They're all a couple years in the league wondering what their next contract's going to be. But if you add Wimbanyama to that or a Scoot Henderson or even a Brandon Miller, like I don't, it's going to be really weird. And they have a really good chance of getting one of those three guys. But I do care about that outcome. All right. Uh, Rudy Gobert, don't care. Pretty harsh about it on Sunday. I'm completely over it. You know how like there's a player that's criticized all the time and then they'll have a nice game? And just a side note, if there's a player that I don't necessarily like, it doesn't mean I think that player is going to have zero points per game for the rest of their fucking career. It usually is a player that has a standing that's high enough that I'm even talking about him knowing full well that player will probably have some big games. Does it sound like I'm talking about Russell Westbrook? Perhaps. That could be a good guess. Uh, but whenever something happens and that player like lights it up, and he's been somebody that's been criticized a lot. It's like, man, we need to apologize to this dude. Rudy Gobert needs to apologize to me for having to watch this for this long. Here's what I would do with Minnesota because he's suspended in the play game here in the Lakers. And I do care about the West plan. I'm not sure that I care that much about the East plan. But if Gobert wants to come back, if Minnesota were to lose this game, right? I would, If I were the team, I would quiz him. I would quiz Gobert about the Lakers game tonight. And if it seems like he passes the quiz and he watched and he cared about the outcome and he was rooting on the Timberwolves, then I would be like, all right, you're ready to go. That is if Minnesota doesn't just win tonight against the Lakers. Nobody is picking them. ESPN.com started looking at some of their picks there. 17 people picking these playing games. 17 people picked the Lakers. Not saying they're wrong, but again, 17 zip. That's, uh, that's a landslide. If Gobert failed the quiz, if it was pretty clear that he was watching, I don't know, beef on Netflix, I'd be like, you know what? You're not playing in the next game either. And maybe that hurts them, definitely hurts them in the Lakers matchup. Uh, but it it just seems to be pretty clear whether stuff you saw on the court or some of the lingering stuff after this altercation with Kyle Anderson. I think his teammates are a little over him, which also seems to match that a lot of his teammates in Utah were also over him as well. Thanks for the screens, bro. Thanks for the help side defense. We can never trust you to actually catch the basketball and hang on to it. Sorry. Enjoy the next three years at like 170 million bucks. Okay. Uh, I do care about the West plan, like I said, but I am a little worried about the risk. We've covered all my thoughts on the plan before. Remember two years ago, Steph Golden State, the eight seed, and then they weren't in the playoffs. I was like, oh, cool system. This is awesome. Uh, they lost to the Lakers in the 7-8 matchup last second. Well, under a minute left, huge three by LeBron, wins the game. And then Golden State lost in overtime to Memphis. It's like, cool system. Now Steph's not here. Not that that team was loaded, but we were denied Steph. I would hate, I would care if we were denied LeBron James in the playoffs. Doesn't feel like they're going to lose to Minnesota. We know how good the defense is. The talent is better. One game scenario, Anthony Edwards goes off. Mike Conley starts hitting shots. Janet Joel Russell is no longer a plus 15 like he was with the Lakers, despite having a net negative defensively his entire career. Will Russell match the intensity that is needed in the playoffs? Will he feel that? Because the weird thing about Russell is he's so talented and the game is so slow for him, he can actually go slower than he needs to. Will he not do those things in huge playoff moments? I don't know. That's one game. You're a little nervous, Lakers fans, even if everybody's picking you. But if they were to lose that and say, I don't know, lose to New Orleans, if they beat OKC on the other part of that, then it's like, cool, cool system. We don't have LeBron in the playoffs, even if it feels a little unlikely. I'm not sure I care about the East playing games. Miami can't score. They can't shoot. They were net negative on the season. Their defense has actually gotten worse since the All-Star break. Atlanta's offense is awesome since the All-Star break. The defense is terrible again. Chicago's defense is awesome since the All-Star break. And Toronto and Chicago have done some things. But not to be dismissive, 
it just feels a little bit like it's a reach to pick any of those teams to come out of the plane and then start beating Milwaukee or Boston. It just doesn't. I know every Celtics fan seems haunted by Miami in the Eastern Conference Finals last year. I just wonder how much Miami they've watched. How could you watch this Miami team this year that goes 44 and 38 and go, yeah, I'm scared of them. If you're any good, you should beat them despite Spolster's ability in a series to maybe outcoach everybody else. But I'm not sure I'm super worked up about that. Kyrie Irving, do I care? I'd like to say I don't, but I care. I definitely care. I can't wait to see what fucking happens. I can't wait to see what happens. And I can't wait to care an unhealthy amount about the next guy that decides that he's going to start calling his shots. This will be different because he's a free agent, but there's a chance. There's a chance here. It's always going to get spicy with this one. The last thing is I care about history. Boston has, and I couldn't even find it beyond like the last 26 seasons I was looking up. Boston at a plus 6.5 point differential is the worst one I could find in 26 seasons. That speaks to this season. All right. Think about that. That's the worst net rating point differential. It probably goes like 30, 40s. I don't know. I don't know how much longer it goes, but all of these great teams in the past, the Lakers team, San Antonio, Prime Duncan stuff, um, the Sacramento Kings got a couple big ones in there. Milwaukee one year was like double digits and astounding. Now they didn't do anything. They lost to Miami in the second round of the playoffs just a few years ago. But that is a very, very low number, which speaks to what we saw this season because this is wide open. It feels wide open. Uh, And that's why I can't wait to get ready for playoffs. 